They left their workbenches, their looms, and their fields to go off and fight a war to save the Union. And while slavery was an important reason for some, the principal motivation for most soldiers was to save their country. Some even thought it would be a great adventure. Glorious battlefield deeds the soldiers would return home to tell and regale their hometown friends with. And yet it was the Civil War which for the first time adequately communicated the true horror of the battlefield to the home front. With advances in photography, communication devices such as the telegraph, and numerous war newspaper correspondence, the impact of the brutal conflict was adequately brought home to a young America. The carnage from advanced weapons technology combined with outdated battlefield tactics left many a family deep in mourning. And how did the people of the Blackstone Valley cope with the long wait for news, not knowing what was happening? Was their son okay? Was he healthy? Was he eating right? Some of those very same issues that parents have today when their sons or daughters are away fighting for their country. This is Chuck Arning, ranger for the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, and I'm here at Waters Farm in Sutton, Massachusetts. This was a working farm during the Civil War, and was from fields like these as young soldiers went away to fight and left their loved ones home to worry. And worry they did, for the horrors of the battlefield took many a young man well before his time. Now we're going to examine the human interest stories that emerged from the Blackstone Valley during this bloody conflict. Join me as we look at the Civil War through the home front. The great Union general, William Tecumseh Sherman, wrote, You cannot qualify war in any harsher terms than I will. War is cruelty, and it cannot be refined. War is indeed cruel, unforgiving, and unjust. And all the glory and honor and horror of war is captured in the story of Sullivan Ballou of North Smithfield, Rhode Island. Now let's catch up with Tom Shanahan, a historian and head librarian at the Adams Library in Central Falls, and learn about Sullivan Ballou and the true meaning of sacrifice. In talking about the human side of the Civil War, it's very appropriate we single out a couple of leaders that came out of the Blackstone Valley that gave of their life to the Union cause. And one of those was Sullivan Ballou. Now I'm here today in the Meshassic Cemetery, right in the Central Falls Lincoln Line, with Tom Shanahan, who's the head librarian at the Adams Public Library in Central Falls, and who is also a Civil War historian, and one of the people who's taken an interest in the life of Sullivan Ballou. Now, Tom, Sullivan Ballou was one of those individuals who heard the call of his nation and answered it, and he gave up a lot, didn't he? Yes, he certainly did. Uh, Sullivan Ballou was town moderator here in Central Falls in 1855. He actually got his uh, law degree in uh, 1853 from Boston Law, Academy in Boston, New York. Uh, he was, again, a town moderator. He was also unanimously voted Speaker of the House in Rhode Island. He served uh, two calls there. He was all clerk of the court for many years before actually assuming the role of Speaker of the House. He also ran for Attorney General on, with James Y. Smith. and. James Y. Smith went on to become governor when Sprague actually took the seat vacated by a senator. Uh, this was while the wall was in progress. So Sullivan Ballou, with that kind of a background, could have possibly been the attorney general or something else within the state. He gave up, he did, he really gave up a lot. Now he was quite a, quite a self-made man, he really was. and. Uh, it seems to have passed on to his children as well, but they both had to make their own way in life without their father, as Sullivan did. Uh, but he just saw, when you read the letter, you can see the, that he sees the much bigger picture of really what, uh, of what they fought for in the revolution. Um, you know, he just, um, 
you know, today, I don't know how many of us would be able to sacrifice that much. He possibly could have been attorney general, attorney general in Rhode Island. Uh, who knows? Possibly governor. Um, but he had a, a a particularly rosy future and gave it up because he could see um, the direction the country was going and wanted to make it right. In reading the letter, it's so poignant that um, he seemed to have a premonition of what was going to happen. Um, in fact, that, that letter was never sent. But there were two other letters after that letter that, uh, that arrived that Sarah received, but not this letter. It seems that it was, it was in his trunk. And, you know, if, if he didn't arrive, the, the letter would be sent. Um, I think he was hoping that he would be able to show it to her at some later date. But I think he realized that the way the combat tactics were of those times, that that, that was extremely uh, limited, if, if at all. And that's what happened. Now, the letter we're referring to was a letter that was made famous by Ken Burns in the PBS TV Civil War series. Yes. And one of the things about it was it reflected all the education he received, but also an excellent writing style. It was a very well-written letter, wasn't it? Oh, it's, um, it's very articulate. Um, he, it, it, he talks about returning as a, as a gust of wind and caressing her cheek. Uh, um, there are there are a number of phrases in there that uh, um, I wish I could write as well um, to someone that that I was in love with. It's a, it's a beautiful beautiful love letter, and it's it's sad, but you know it's a legacy that um, uh, I guess in the Civil War many that basically was the only way to communicate was was the written letter uh, and you know Sullivan had it to an art form. I, I think this one must have come from the heart deeper than most uh, but it, once you've read the letter um, it, 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 it can't help but affect you. Uh, it has, uh, uh, the first time I heard it uh, was on the Ken Burns special on the Civil War in the very first segment of that I think it's Robeson who reads the letter and uh, I didn't know it was going to play a significant part in the library's history, uh, but when I first heard the letter, uh, I was moved. We have reproduced the letter along with pictures of Sarah and Sullivan, and uh, the letter is being used to raise money for restoration for the library. So, but it, it, you've got to read the letter to really feel, uh, and you can. He really gets his feelings out, the depth of his feelings for his country, uh, for the future, uh, for freedom, uh, and for his family. Uh, the original letter has never been found, and I believe it was buried with Sarah, as Ken Burns expressed when he, when he talked at Alumni Hall. It's the only fitting end to this, you know. I think a lot of people don't realize that during the Civil War, uh, to get the body of your son back was a very painstaking yeah, process. It because, was a uh, significant undertaking. Yes. The, the uh, transportation of these three men is um, well documented in the uh, regimental history. Uh, the bodies were found, again, Sullivan's body had been mutilated. Uh, the story is that it was mistaken for Slocum's body. Now, what uh, Colonel Slocum did at the Battle Bull Run to warrant this, I have no idea. Sullivan, Slocum, and Tower, uh, in fact, Tower's body was, was buried face down, and uh, I didn't know the significance of that for quite some time. And in talking to other Civil War buffs, they tell me that that's so that the, you can't sit up on Judgment Day. So I guess, you know, in, in one shape or one way or another, there are atrocities committed in all wars. Now, the Battle of the uh, First Bull Run, or Manassas, if you're a Confederate. Uh, that's true. They had two names. Yeah. It was a significant battle because everybody had this perception that the war would be over in just six months. Absolutely. It would be a very short term. We're going uh, to beat the, these rebels back. And it was a big social affair to a large yes, degree. Yes, uh, absolutely. And yet Sullivan had this premonition that the war was going to be a lot harder and longer. Yes, I'm not, you're right. I'm not sure I know uh, what brought this on. Uh, maybe it was the, uh, the tactics of the day. Uh, he had been um, in the Woonsocket Guards. He, was a, um, he had started as a, um, um, an orderly, I believe, and worked his way up to lieutenant. So he was aware of the arms of the day, and this probably had some 
part in that premonition. Um, the, they were firing these weapons at point blank range. I mean, they were basically in each other's faces, uh, which is, you know, which you, you don't see that in any type of uh, conflict today. So the Battle of First Bull Run really changed the whole concept of the war for the uh, the North, anyhow, and I guess the South of that matter too. I think a lot of people suddenly realize there's going to be a much longer conflict, a much deadlier conflict, and the uh, impact on the home front would be significant. Absolutely. Even Lincoln's first call was only for three months. Right. Uh, even he thought that uh, uh, raising an army, uh, and, and the Rhode Islanders were the, the first um, to arrive on the scene. Now, Tom, if you had to sum up what you consider to be the, uh, the key points of what Sullivan Ballou meant to Rhode Island, to the country, to the north at that time. What, how, how would you summarize that? Well, um, first I think you'd have to read the letter. Um, uh, that seems to really sum up for me. Uh, uh, there's such a range of emotion, a range of feelings uh, that transcend uh, a lot, a lot, uh, for me anyway. Uh, uh, but he just was able to see the much larger picture of freedom and what it would mean to future generations, to his boys, and everything else. Um, he, uh, he, again, you have to read the letter. Once you've, once you've read the letter, uh, I think it, you can see um, what, uh, what he was striving for, that, uh, that he uh, wanted the best, and, and this was his way of giving it. And he basically gave his life for his country. Um, very few of us, I think, could even approach that, uh, that type of uh, attitude today. It's a much more selfish society, I think, than, uh, than, in, than in Sullivan's time. Ken Burns' epic documentary on the Civil War brought the letter to life, and it touched all who heard it. Hear again the words of Sullivan Ballou as he writes to his beloved wife, Sarah, just before the first great battle of the war. July 14, 1861. Camp Clark, Washington. My very dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eyes when I shall be no more. I have no misgivings about or a lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly American civilization now leans on the triumph of the government and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and sufferings of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. And it seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence could break. And yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me unresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. The memories of the blissful moments I have spent with you come creeping over me, and I feel most gratified to God and to you that I have enjoyed them so long. And hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years, when, God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and seen our sons grown to honorable manhood around us. I have, I know, but few and small claims upon divine providence. But something whispers to me, perhaps it is the wafted prayer of my little Edgar, that I shall return to my loved ones unharmed. If I do not, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I loved you. And when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and the many pains I have caused you. How thoughtless and foolish I have oftentimes been. How gladly would I wash out my tears, every little spot upon your happiness. But, O oh Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they loved, I shall always be near you. In the gladdest days and in the darkest nights, always, always. And if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it shall be my breath as the cool air fans your throbbing temple, it shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone and wait for thee, for we shall meet again.
Civil War dominated life in the 1860s. The mills of the Blackstone Valley geared up to manufacture the textiles, the munitions, and the weapons the Union wartime effort demanded. And the home front was busy, too. Let's catch up with Ranger Suzanne Buchanan and learn about the women's war efforts on the home front. Wartime needs created many opportunities. Just look at the Blackstone Valley's quick response to demands of supplies and equipments from the North. With the huge amount of men enlisted, requiring uniforms, staying in camps and in forts, their personal needs far exceeded the ability for the government to provide for them. In stepped the women of the home front. Patriotic women of the communities organized a variety of groups to show support to the Union soldiers. On April 24, 1861, in the vestry of the Central Street Church in Worcester, the Worcester Soldiers Relief Committee was organized. They organized neighborhood sewing bees, preparing the necessities and comforts that were desperately needed by the soldiers. The contents of some of the boxes sent to the troops from these relief organizations included quilts, blankets, towels, sheets, 1,200 pair of mittens, 1,400 pair of socks, 1,300 shirts, and 1,100 handkerchiefs. Can you imagine the commitment the ladies showed to the Union effort? The soldiers greatly appreciated the benevolence of the ladies. A soldier with the Emmett Guards wrote home and said, The boys look finely since they got their new coats and pants. The ladies of Worcester are deserving of great praise. But if they could only see the poor fellows receiving their offering, it would be a sufficient reward for anything they've done or can do. However, women were not content staying at home. They wanted to play a more active role in the union's efforts. Their initial idea was to volunteer as field nurses. Though prior to the Civil War, female nursing was not a trained profession. And it was believed not to be a ladylike profession either. Women were believed to be too weak, too emotional, too squeamish for the horrors of the battlefield. And their initial volunteer efforts were rejected. The Army simply did not know how to deal with women in the field. Yet as the awful toll of the wounded and the death rose, the Army was forced to accept the women's care for the soldiers, both on the field and back at the Army hospitals. By the end of the war, there was 3,200 women who served as Union nurses. They received $12.50 a month, while male nurses were paid $20.50 a month. Some things never change. While surgeons at first objected to females in the battlefield, their presence was a great comfort to the men. Mrs. Helen E. Smith and five other young women left Worcester in 1862 to serve as nurses. Turned down initially due to their youth, the horrors of war provided ample nursing opportunities. She spent her last two years in South Carolina caring for wounded Union soldiers. Living till the age of 90, she had a great opportunity to tell many her story of being a field nurse in the Civil War. This has been Ranger Suzanne Buchanan bringing you a Blackstone Moment. Sometimes music can soothe the wounded heart, make unbearable pain bearable again. And such may well be the case of the haunting ballad, The Vacant Chair, a moving account of an all too common wartime story. A young man goes off to war, the fight for a noble cause, full of life, full of energy, full of courage only to return home, draped in the battle shroud of the warrior dead. The Civil War brought us many memorable and poignant stories of that era. The terrible swift sword of war took its victims without mercy, but it left their stories behind. The story of the vacant chair from Worcester, Massachusetts is one such story that you'll remember. Henry Washburn's son's best friend was Willie Grout, and it is that friendship that is the center of the story of the vacant chair. Willie Grout was an energetic 17-year-old who had just graduated from Highland Academy here in Worcester, Massachusetts as the captain of cadets. Now at a time 
when there was very little military knowledge, let alone experience in the general populace of the United States, John William Grout was blessed with a keen military mind. And although he was too young to join the Union forces without his parents' permission, he was able to drill the raw recruits of the freshly organized 15th Massachusetts Volunteers. They were training at Camp Scott in the southern section of the city of Worcester. His energy and knowledge attracted the attention of Colonel George Ward, who organized the 15th. He promised Willie's parents that he wouldn't let the 15th ship out until young Willie had turned 18. His parents finally agreed, and Willie became a proud officer in the 15th Massachusetts Regiment. Poolsville, Virginia was his first real military station. Picket duty was his first command. The forces of the Union Army, regrouping after their disaster at Bull Run, were sent across the Potomac to scout the area around Leesburg, Virginia, rumored to have been vacated by the Rebel Army. The scouting unit came back with terribly erroneous information. There were no Rebs in Leesburg, they said. The command was then given to the 15th to occupy the city, and the battle that was never meant to be was about to begin. 2,000 federal troops were ferried across the raging Potomac, and once on the other side, they had to climb steep river bluffs to reach an open field. And there on the open field, they found the Confederates, in force, in a well-protected position, using the newly rifled muskets. Controversy in command, which was to plague the Union Army throughout the war, caused needless casualties to the men of the 15th, and made an untenable position impossible. Willie and his comrades fought bravely in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And when the retreat was sounded, Willie helped the wounded into the few boats still afloat to get them back across the river. Finally, his colonel told him, you've done all you can, save yourself. Many would try and swim the treacherous current, only be swept away under the waters of the Potomac. But Willie was a strong swimmer and was confident he'd reach the other side safely. But fate was not smiling that night, for the moon was full. And one comrade later wrote that bullets splashed around him like rain on a pond. A rebel bullet caught up to young Willie and his lifeless body was swept downstream. On a cold November day, Lieutenant John William Grout returned home to Worcester to be laid to rest in the rural cemetery off Grove Street. But young Willie's story doesn't end here. Henry Washburn, Willie's friend's father, writes a poem for the family to be read at the first major gathering after the funeral. He simply signs it HSW, and the Worcester spy prints it. And somehow, the American composer George Root comes across the poem, adds a melody, and turns the vacant chair into the most popular ballad during the Civil War. The tragedy of war touches a home. And during the Civil War, many homes will be touched and changed forever. Henry Washburn's poem, The Vacant Chair, was transformed into a popular ballad during the Civil War and allowed many families to endure the loss of a loved one. And how did families cope with the often devastating news from the battlefield? Well, the courtesy and dignity extended to families who have lost a soldier at war was quite different back in the 1860s. Let's go back in time. With aided with the music of our good friends Pendragon and members of the Rhode Island Sons of the Union veterans, let's experience an era gone by and feel the emotions that are still with us today. Let's hear the vacant chair as it would have been played back during the Civil War.
meet, but we shall miss you. There will be one vacant chair. We shall linger to caress him while we breathe our evening prayer. When a year ago we gathered, joy was in his mild blue eye. But a golden cord is severed, and our hopes in ruin lie. We shall meet, but we shall miss him. There will be one vacant chair. We shall linger to caress him when we breathe our evening prayer. At our fireside, sad and lonely, often will the bosom swell at remembrance of the story. Letter writing was the major means of the communications that families had available to them during the Civil War. The daily ritual of writing a loved one far away from home and fighting a war was duplicated time and time again by the people of Blackstone Valley. Today, as we read these letters again, a whole new era comes to life. The fears, the anxieties, the hopes, and the day-to-day -day routine of the people of Blackstone Valley during the 1860s becomes very real to us. Let's listen to the words of Mrs. Emily Mayo Ward, wife of Colonel George Ward of the 15th Massachusetts, as she writes to her husband, who's away fighting the Confederate forces during the years 1861 to 1863. My very dear husband, what should we do if we couldn't write to each other? My chief comfort is in receiving and writing of letters. I got one from you this afternoon and it was so welcome. Little George wants to know what made Papa go to Virginia and I tell him to take care of the 15th Regiment. Then he asks what makes the 15th Regiment stay there. This morning he was talking about you and asking ever so many questions, and at last he said, oh dear, I wish the war would be over, then Papa would come home. Colonel George Ward, 15th Massachusetts, was killed during the second day of intense fighting at Gettysburg, July 2nd, 1863. 